bank. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Money in the Bank, the podcast where we talk about all things related to personal finance and then some. So I know I recorded an episode last week on how to find a job and Brett wasn't with me and he's actually not with me here again. Um, hopefully he will be back very, very soon. But we are in the process of moving and he's working in a different city, so scheduling things is very difficult right now. So bear with me. I know it's probably not as much fun to just have me chatting at you guys, but it, you know, at least I'm getting some episodes out, some content out, and he will be back very, very soon. Because obviously we need him for the trivia questions. Like my intro isn't as good without the trivia questions for Brett. So, um, I guess just jumping right in, if you live in America, as I do, um, and I do apologize, the next few episodes will be kind of heavily focused on America, and then we hope to kind of expand and talk about some more international content at some point, but if you live in America, you will know that we recently had our midterm elections. Now, I know they say don't talk about politics, but I am actually here this week to talk about politics. I think it's we don't actually talk very often about how the politics of our country affect our personal finance situation. And I think it's actually kind of beneficial because I think right now there's a lot of divide in this country. And I was actually talking to Brett recently. We were watching some of our gubernatorial debate and I was telling him, you know, it's just frustrating because I feel like and I know this has always kind of been true, but I feel like the candidates don't even actually talk about anything of substance. They just sit there and argue like 14-year-old girls and boys. So I think we would be a much more productive country right now if people could have civilized discussions and stop being so darn ridiculous all the time. Um, That's all I'll have to say to vent, I guess, about the state of politics here in America because I won't uh, I'm, I'm really trying to make this in a very unbiased way, so I'm not going to agree or disagree with either side, but rather I'm going to present the facts because I think that that is something that does not happen nearly often enough, and I think it is really beneficial to kind of just understand more what each side is doing or has to offer. Now, I will also caveat this and say this is my interpretation of the of the facts, uh, which is a weird sentence. So this is my opinion. This is what I've gathered from research and readings I have done. But I will also admit that I was never a political science major. Politics are not my life. I do pay attention to them, but there may be things that I have missed or skipped over. So I, I will present to you the best information I have and on, on a variety of topics, but please feel free to do your own research. And again, I'm not talking about any individual candidates. I'm more just talking about broader terms. What do what does the Democratic Party typically support and what does the Republican Party typically support? So individual candidates might have their own opinions. This is just kind of back to the ideology. All right, with all of those caveats, don't get mad at me for doing an episode on politics. Pretty please. We will all love each other at the end of this, I promise. So jumping right in, the first thing I want to talk about is actually retirement benefits in general. So we've talked before on this podcast that there are two kind of retirement benefits. There's defined contribution, which we typically think of as 401ks or 403bs or IRAs. And then there are defined benefits, which we typically think of as pensions. Now, the difference between the two is defined contribution. You kind of, like it says, you know what you are contributing. So typically you will put in, you know, 6% of your paycheck, your employer might match 6%, and that's all you know. But they don't guarantee that you will get a certain amount of income at any age for any duration of time. So you have to save up a certain amount and then retire and manage your money well. Now, there's other tools out there that can help you with, but that's the basic premise of that idea. The other one is a defined benefit or pension type plan. So basically, that means you might put in a certain amount of your paycheck or it's just part of your benefits package at work 
So your employer contributes to this plan the entire time. And then at the end of your working career, maybe you work there for 30 years, there's a formula that says they will pay out a certain percentage of your highest three years, for example. So perhaps you get you know $2,000 per month for the rest of your life. Now, um, a couple different things with these, they may or may not be inflation adjusted, and they you know, may or may not um, include some type of health benefit on top of it. So that's kind of the two basic flavors. Now, something we all kind of hear about in this country that is a political issue is Social Security. So Social Security, we actually all pay for it each and every paycheck. Um, I believe it's a right around 6%. That goes to Social Security that we pay. Your employer also pays a share. So if you are self-employed, you have to pay, you know, both of that. And the idea there being when you, I think, as early as 62, or you can take it at 65 or 70, you can elect to start drawing a monthly benefit that you will get every month for the rest of your life. Now, this is an area where there's a lot of people that have a lot of uncertainty about Social Security in the future. So I will say right now, the latest report I saw from um, the actuaries actually that work on the Social Security plan said that it is 100% funded for the next 15 years and it is 90% funded for the next 25 years. So typically, um, you know, both parties, Democrats and Republicans, want to work to solve this problem because when you think about 25 years, there are, you know, we have a lot of baby boomers that are nearing retirement age right now or have already reached retirement age. And if somebody's 60 right now and they start taking this benefit, there is a decent chance that they are going to have that benefit paid for 25 years. And if you're in your 40s, you know, you're going to think you're, you want this benefit to still exist in 25 years. So it is something that, you know, a lot of people are counting on or relying on as part of their retirement strategy. So typically the two party sides to solve this problem is Republicans want to trim the benefits back a little bit. They think that perhaps they've gotten a little strong and the benefits could be pared down a little bit, and by reducing how much you have to pay out, then the pool of money that exists can last longer. So, for example, this might mean moving the drawing age out. So instead of being able to turn it on at 62, perhaps you have to wait until age 70. Um, One of the arguments for this is that when Social Security was kind of implemented back in, I believe it was during the New Deal, um, that FDR created is don't quote me on that I believe that's when it was implemented though um, the idea was that the age was actually set at you know right around 62 I believe and life expectancy wasn't that much longer so the life expectancy in 1935 when it was implemented was 62 and the you couldn't actually get the benefit until age 65. So Social Security was originally kind of implemented as a way to pay out retirement benefits for the elderly in our society who could really no longer work and could enjoy their remaining years in peace. Um, obviously, now the, re- the life expectancy in this country is in the 80s, and we still turn this benefit on actually even earlier. We turn on at 62 Uh, instead of 65. Um, You can wait till 65 or 70 and get a higher amount, but you can elect to turn on at 62. So it went from kind of being a post-life expectancy, you know, only kind of paying out the people who, you know, lived past that to a, you know, really something that was paying out for the majority of Americans for actually, you know, quite some time, potentially 15, 20 years or more. So, A lot of people argue that it was never intended to be sent up this way, and it is not priced correctly. So even though we all contribute a part of our paychecks to it, they argue that it's still not enough to fund it at the level it is. So some people say, you know, the ways to solve that is to move the issue, the attained age, I guess, so you can turn it on later in life. Another way to solve it would be to reduce the benefits. So, you know, the other argument is it was never intended to cover your full retirement. And there are people 
out there who rely on Social Security as 100% of their retirement package. And so by cutting the benefit and saying, no, it's only going to you know account for 30% of your retirement, you could free up more money. On the flip side, Democrats typically do not want to reduce the benefits. They instead would rather increase taxes or um, increase spending to fund the Social Security programs. Their argument is that even though it might have not been set up that way 80 years ago when it was created, that is what it has evolved to, and people are counting on this and relying on this system to continue existing in their retirement, or they would not be able to afford to live. Um, They typically also push a little bit more for the cost of living adjustments every year under Social Security. So that is something that is a benefit of Social Security. If you have it, they will look at it every year and adjust it for inflation. So let's say inflation went up 2%, then instead of getting, you know, $100 a month, you would get $102 a month. So, um, you know, that's... That's kind of their angle is that they would like to keep this fully funded instead of cutting it in any way. Um, Another area of retirement is pensions. Now, there are state pensions and there are private pensions. So um, typically, the government only really has control over the state pensions. But uh, I will say that there were several Republicans that ran on agendas to cut public pensions and replace them with a defined contribution system. And typically they were not voted into office because clearly people kind of like having their known fixed income. So um, again, you know, teachers still kind of fall into the public pension pool and Democrats will typically fight to keep those systems intact where Republicans might say, hey, let's replace that with defined contributions. Now you might be thinking, well, which one's better? Um, Actually, this is an interesting question, and setting aside all political talk or affiliation, there is this kind of moral debate. Um, But, you know, people will ask me, what is better, a defined contribution plan or a defined benefit plan? And actually, if you do the math, if you are willing to save your money, so typically when when employers switch to a defined contribution plan from a defined benefit plan, your salary goes up because they are passing that burden kind of onto you. So let's say they were funding a pension plan for you and it was costing them 15% of your annual salary. Well, after the change, they might pass on a 10% raise to you and then say, like, we'll contribute 5% if you contribute 5%. So the problem, though, is people typically will say, okay, I'll just contribute the 5%, but really you should contribute the 10% and their 5%. But then at the end of the day, being invested in your own funds, you will actually be able to purchase a richer benefit for yourself in retirement than the pension plan would. Because typically pension plans have to be invested a little bit more conservatively than you could invest your own funds. So from a purely mathematical perspective, defined contribution is actually better because you have the money and it moves with you. So the other hard thing about pensions is if you move companies a lot, then you never kind of reach that like 30 years, highest three years salary is your pension. And instead, you kind of have all of these like little tiny pensions lumped together. So defined contributions give you a lot more flexibility to change jobs and keep your benefits with you. And actually invested properly, you can end up ahead. Now, the reason this is um, a bit of a moral debate is it's a lot easier for people who make more money to save that money. So if you are near the poverty line, if you get an even if you get an extra fifteen percent on your paycheck, you will likely have to keep that. Um, and the reasons for that are, if you're near the poverty line, you might get some assistance like reduced housing or, you know, bridge cards, that sort of thing, or subsidized health care. Now, when you start making fifteen percent more, then your expenses go up, and you can't afford to save that for retirement because. You just need to cover your basic human needs of food, healthcare, etc. So you can't actually save that money. So now you lost your retirement 
and you're still barely getting by. So that's why there's this kind of debate about what's better. So, you know, technically from a mathematical standpoint, defined contribution is better. But um, I do understand the other side and why people like the security of a pension because it's something that you don't have to worry about. And I think a lot of times when you, you know, kind of give that power back to the people and the other problem that we have in this country is we don't educate everybody in high school on how to save in a defined contribution plan, then there's that gap in knowledge. And when there's that gap in knowledge, how can you expect people to know how much to save? So that's kind of my rant on that. And hopefully that kind of helps answer what's better um, and where each party stands. So typically, you know, Democrats will kind of continue funding defined benefit plans a bit more and Republicans will push for defined contribution plans. And the other kind of nice thing, though, is Republicans typically also push for increased limits on 401ks. So this year, the maximum you could contribute tax-free to a 401k was 18500 And next year, that will be bumped up to 19000 So that's, you know, kind of something else. Um, But one other point I wanted to mention that perhaps is Michigan specific. I have not checked this out in other countries or not countries, but other states. In Michigan, we actually had a pension tax put in play um, by by the Republican side. Um, The concept behind this was they, you know, were trying to make up budget deficits and they found, you know, an, an area of income tax that was of income that was not currently being taxed, and they found that in pensions. So they applied a pension tax. Now, we did elect a Democrat who ran a very strong campaign against this tax, and she wants to remove it. So she, she does not think it is fair to tax retirees because they've already been taxed on this money, and they should get it tax-free, in her opinion. So that's, I think that covers all of our kind of retirement benefits. So we touched on defined contribution, defined benefits, and then, you know, the pension tax that is applied in some states. So yeah, that covers that. So now we will talk about another very hot topic, which is healthcare. Um, This is kind of a very buzzy one. And again, I'm really trying to just lay out some facts and I'm not siding with anybody here. So as we all know, um, Obama was a Democrat and he put in probably the largest health legislative this country has ever seen. So he introduced the Affordable Care Act or as some finally call it Obamacare. Um, basically, the Affordable Care Act did multiple things. It it um, made it so it was a mandate for every single person to get health insurance in this country or you would have to pay a fine. That was one thing it did. It also eliminated pre-existing conditions, which meant even if you had pre-existing conditions, you could be insured under a health insurance policy. And what many people will say was it raised premiums. Um, that That's kind of like a constant thing. So Republicans, when when they came into office a couple of years ago, one of the things that they did to change health insurance was to remove the penalty. If you if you don't want health insurance, it's okay. You can elect to not have it, and you don't have to pay a penalty. This will actually go into effect in 2019. It has already passed. However, now that we got through the midterms, it is there's speculation that few other things will pass, and the Affordable Care Act is very likely here to stay. That's kind of the popular opinion at this point. They think that the repeal is completely off the table. Another thing that many people assume is now here to stay is coverage for pre-existing conditions. So I will say um, the typical Democratic standpoint at this point and what they kind of hope to accomplish is to stabilize the marketplace. So If you are in America and you are covered under the Affordable Care Act and you cannot get insurance through your employer, then you typically buy it through the marketplace. Um, Over the years, the marketplace premiums have gone kind of wonky and people have had a hard time, you know, purchasing healthcare in this way. Um, And a lot of times, you know, the 
the payments or the discounts that are given to people might not be accurately counted or calculated, and it can be kind of crazy. So one of the big goals is to stabilize the marketplace and provide more money to help consumers roll in enroll in health insurance under the Affordable Care Act. So over the last couple of years, the Republican-controlled environment has cut funding for insurance counselors and enrollment assistant by 84%. So this means people are having a harder time, you know, getting the help they need to get enrolled. And it's kind of, you know, when, when funding's cut, things become more difficult, right? So Democrats really want to push to stabilize that and make it easier. Um, they also want to rein in drug prices. So this is actually a bipartisan issue at this point. Um, both the Republicans and Democrats want to rein in drug prices. So the Republicans have actually proposed um, kind of two solutions. Uh, one would be to require drug manufacturers to include the list price of drugs in any television advertising. And the other would reduce Medicare payments for certain high-cost drugs by using the average of prices in other kind of advanced health insurance com- countries. So, um, you know, a big kind of key indicator there right now is a lot of people end up ordering prescription drugs from Canada because they are so much cheaper than here, where if that was kind of factored into the average price, then people could order the drugs right in this country. Um and, and by having, you know, the, the prices on the television advertising, then you're not, you're just more aware. So that's also kind of a big benefit of switching to a high deductible plan is it promotes the concept of shopping around. Now, obviously, if you are in a medical emergency, you do not have the luxury of shopping around. If you chop off your arm, you just have to go to the hospital and get it fixed. This is where kind of federal regulation needs to come in and have prices set so that you're not getting gouged by, because you accidentally drove to the wrong hospital. Um, because actually the hospital, two different hospitals in the same exact town might have a difference of thousands of dollars for basically the same care and the same treatment. So by making prices more transparent, the idea is that it would kind of fall back on the consumer to make a reasonable decision. If you knew that these two prescription drugs would work in a similar way and one costs you $5 a month and one costs you $85 a month, you would likely go with the cheaper option. Um, You know, I have an example of this. Actually, when I was in college, I had to be on a medication and I had no idea how much a medication costs because it was covered by my insurance. Then I switched insurance. I, you know, when I was in college, I was on my dad's insurance plan. When I switched off of it, I got on a high deductible plan and the, you know, insur- the prescription that I just picked up for free on my old insurance plan, all of a sudden, because I was on, high deduct- on a high deductible plan, I had to pay the full price of that medication. And I found out that it was $120. So I immediately contacted my doctor and I said, is there any other prescription I could be on that does the same thing? And there was. So I switched and my new cost was, I kid you not, $8. So just by sometimes asking the question, you can switch to a generic and it's much cheaper. So um, both issue, both parties agree with this, that it should, you know, not be that expensive. Um, but I will say at this point, the Democrats are much more um, on board with kind of preserving the Affordable Care Act and making it better or beefing it up. And they are also very supportive of expanding Medicaid. Um, Medicaid is another program similar to Social Security that funding is running out. Um, Democrats are very much in support of expanding that, beefing it up, getting securing the funding necessary to make that a continued program in this country, where Republicans kind of take the other approach and think, that, you know, perhaps Medicaid has gotten, you know, too big or it doesn't need to be expanded. And they also don't necessarily agree with the Affordable Care Act. Again, I I do kind of think it is here to stay at this point with the results of the midterm election, giving the, you know, House back to the Democratic Party. But, you know, Republicans have ran, many of them have run on campaigns of finding a different solution to the health care problem. Now, just to kind of take a step back and talk about the Affordable Care Act, I want to be clear that 
the Affordable Care Act was not necessarily responsible for the increased health care costs in this country. Health care costs have been trending upwards for years um, for a variety of reasons. Drug prices keep going up. Malpractice suits keep going up, which require doctors to have more malpractice insurance. And that requires them to charge more for their procedures. Um, I've actually spoken to several people in the medical setting that either work as doctors or dentists telling me that the insurance billing codes have gotten so complicated that they have to either hire entire billing teams or outsource their billing at a premium just to get the codes correct. And that also pushes things up. Um, I will also say too, and I, I learned this on an Andy Ruins Everything YouTube video, so I'm not 100% sure that it's correct, but he um, made a note in that video that hospitals will actually charge more if it's an insurance company versus direct. And I've actually found this true in my experience as well, switching to a high deductible plan. If I tell my doctor I am paying for it out of pocket or it is coming out of my money, magically the price might go down. Or if I mention that, you know, magically I might not need um, all of the treatment that they originally suggested. So there's kind of a lot of facets of uh, why healthcare costs have gone up. And another big thing that the Affordable Care Act did was it covered everybody. This meant that people who hadn't had insurance coverage in years or ever in their lives were covered. And for the first time, they were able to get treatment on things that had never been treated before. Well, typically that meant that their healthcare costs were much higher than the normal person who had had preventative care their entire life. Um, I'm somebody who is very fortunate. I have literally always had health insurance coverage, and I went to the doctor every single year as a child for an annual physical. Uh, people who missed that might have not caught, you know, um, hypertension or high blood pressure or something along those lines, and then all of a sudden they need expensive treatment to fix the issues. So our healthcare costs as a nation spiked because we introduced a cohort of relatively unhealthy people back into the population. Now, this is something that many think will actually decrease the longer we continue all being covered by health insurance because as your, you know, entire population gets healthier, then the health care costs go back down. So, this is something that many people think will actually begin to level off within the next few years here. Um, but, you know, something that could potentially hurt it is if you can elect to not have health insurance, then you you might elect out if you're an uh, able-bodied healthy person. So insurance actually works best because it pools risk. So it's saying all things considered, you know, out of 10 people, one will have this terrible health problem a year, right? Um, but all 10 people pay the premium and then it covers the losses for that one person that year. Well, over the course of 10 years, perhaps they all have one year where they need that money, right? So when you need it, you have it. When you don't need it, you still pay your premiums. The So yeah, I guess long story short, I'm not exactly entirely sure either what the right answer is, but hopefully this kind of helps explain a little bit why health insurance has been on the rise. Um, again, it was not like the Affordable Care Act just increased premiums. Um, it actually reduced premiums for a lot of people by putting in certain rules, but it did increase it for others. One example of this is the Affordable Care Act actually put in rules around how much more expensive health care could be for elderly people. So let's take somebody age 70, for example. Back before the Affordable Care Act, your premium could have been $1,000 a month. And as a 20-something-year-old, perhaps my premium was only $50 a month. Well, that meant that you were literally paying 20 times the amount that I was. The Affordable Care Act said that that was not okay and that ratio couldn't be more than five times. Well, what that meant was premiums for younger people generally went up and premiums for older people were capped at certain amounts. Now, I know I probably have some older listeners who say, hey, my health, you know, my premiums have been going up each and every year too. Well, that is because, as I've mentioned, healthcare costs have been going up each and every year for the past, you know, decade or more, probably even more. So 
it is a huge crisis facing this nation. Um, again, both sides kind of have different plans of attacks. I think in general, there are more democratic candidates and especially more progressives who are pushing for expansion of Medicaid and perhaps are even pushing for universal health care at some point. Republicans are taking the other approach. They think that it'll work out best if we just leave it up to the free market and they'd like to peel back some of the restrictions on it. Um, as to which one's better, you know, who knows? Um, you know, we probably all have our opinions on that and I'm not going to go into that level of detail, but I just kind of wanted to explain some of the differences and hopefully that is kind of helpful. So um, we kind of covered a lot on this podcast. We talk about retirement benefits and health care. So hopefully that just kind of gave you a little bit better kind of unbiased opinion or more information, I guess, on what exactly was happening with those uh, different topics. And maybe you found that interesting or even a little bit helpful. So thanks so much for tuning in this week. If you have any follow-up questions or any questions at all, feel free to email me. I will drop all of my contact information in and I look forward to chatting with you on the next one. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Money in the Bank. Make sure to subscribe to us on the iTunes or Stitcher app so that you get weekly alerts every time we post a podcast. Or if you want, you can visit my website, moneyinthebankpodcast.com. And if you want to reach out with any questions or further comments, please email me at angie at moneyinthebankpodcast.com. I look forward to hearing from you. Money in the Bank.